is moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Over the waters, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the
blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood
Hello City Church fam. It's such a privilege for me to be here with all of you. Now if it's your first time, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors right here at City Church in Cebu City. And I know there are a lot of people watching from different parts of the world and there's a lot of people from the different cities of Cebu. Hey, let us know where you're from in the comments and let us know how we can pray for you. We'd love to hear from you. Um, please pardon us if we take some time to respond to your private messages. Sometimes we get overwhelmed by different questions and, and different um, prayer requests and, and different other, th other inquiries that we have. But please do hit us up. We've got leaders and life group leaders that we want to pray for you. And in a season like this, who doesn't need prayer, right? Let's all be honest about our lives. Let's all lift each other up in the Lord. In fact, today, we even want to pray for other churches that are gathering at this same time that the Lord would bless them and multiply whatever they're doing with the hard work that they put into every single Sunday. Amen. My personal prayer for, for you, from my family to yours, would say, Lord, I pray that this year would be your best Christmas yet. We don't know how that can happen, but we want to see tables filled with family members that are reconciled to each other tables filled with food if you have a christmas tree a christmas tree filled with gifts and may this year be a testimony of the faithfulness of god how he kept you through the pandemic how he kept your family how he kept your marriage how he kept your children may that be your story this year amen now let me just open this service in prayer and then we'll talk for a while and uh, I'm trusting God that there's a word specifically for you. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we honor you today with our lives. We honor you today with our lips. We honor you today with our hearts. God, I thank you that your spirit is here, that you're filling this room even at this very moment. And I pray, Lord, that every person viewing that their houses will be filled with the presence of God that they will feel, Lord, the closeness of God in this very hour that we listen to the Word of God. May families come together with joy and expectancy to hear a new word from the Lord. Lord, I thank you for sustaining us, for keeping us. And Lord, I thank you for bringing families together this wonderful Sunday. We bless you today. We honor you. We thank you for what you're doing, things that we see and things that we don't see though we trust that you're moving. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. If you're new and you want to know more about the church, please look for us on Facebook or YouTube. It's City Church PH. And there you're going to find all the midweek services and all the schedules. So you can throw us a question there and, and we'll be sure to get back to you right away. Amen. And if you have been watching us from week to week, I want to say hi to you, most especially other pastors that watch us and um, life group leaders, those that are involved in ministry, all our volunteers. Thank you guys for, for watching. Say hello in the comments, you know, and we appreciate all of you for even watching this service at the right time, you know, together with everybody else. Oh, special plug. I want to say hello to my co-leaders in the Young Adults Ministry. I want to say hi to Pastor JP and his wife, um, Ma'am Shello, and I want to say hello to Sir Luigi and his wife, Ma'am Corrine. Special mention also our guest speaker last Wednesday in our Young Adults Ministry, Manu Stumpf, who's also very busy in our comment section along with his wife, Sandra. God bless you. Thank you so much for doing what you guys do. Amen. So I'm going to be today at John chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. We're going to go through John chapter 15 verses 1 and we'll try our best to complete it all the way till verse 17. Okay, and then we'll make a lot of stops along the way and let the Word of God preach today. Amen. Let's begin. John chapter 15. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Wow, that one line alone, that's powerful. You have to remember, if we look at the context of John chapter 15, a lot of scholars believe that this was written, this conversation was happening around the time that Jesus was being betrayed. This happened, some believe, after the Last Supper and they were having ex an extended conversation. So the disciples did not really understand that they were about to enter into one of the darkest seasons of their lives that the master that they followed will be betrayed 
and will be put to death. Not just any kind of death, but death on the cross. A shameful death, a criminal's death. And none of them would understand what was going on. They could not reconcile that. How can this man that fed 5,000 people, that opened the ears and the eyes that were blind and that couldn't hear, how can a man, a miracle working man who was God and who we believe to be God, die on a cross? They couldn't reconcile. That's why John 15 is such a powerful piece of scripture because it was a preparatory message before the disciples would step into the darkest season of their lives. And maybe we can relate John 15 to this pandemic we're in. There's a lot of uncertainty in the air. Some of you lost your job. Some of us don't really understand what's going on until when this will be happening. But nevertheless, the word of God stands the test of time. If they were entering a dark season then and we're in a dark season now, the same word that brought them through that dark season will be the same reminders, the same word that will lift us up in this dark season as well. Amen. So John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Jesus was speaking. He says, I am the true vine. You know what that tells me? If he's the true vine, there are false vines. And right, as Christians, we can lose track of the vine that we're attached to because we're so used to being Christians. We're so used to going to church. We got used to working at home. We have the tendency of attaching ourselves to different vines. Maybe your attachment is the vine of the security your job brings and you're drawing life from your job, thinking, ah, I'm going to be good. I took a promotion during this pandemic. Everything's going to be all right. Maybe it's the, it, it can be the, the vine of your friendships and connections in life. Maybe you come from a clan and, and you're very influential right here in Cebu City. And it's your friendships and your connections with people that has become the vine that, which, that, that, that you're connected to. It can be your possessions, the inheritance you received. And there's a security that, come, that comes with that. Isn't it true? And sometimes unknowingly, we're attaching ourselves to that vine when Jesus is saying, no, I am the true vine. Maybe it can be as simple as your vibrant health. You're at the top of your game. You're, you feel as healthy as, as a teenager. And you connect your vine, your, your branch to the vine of your vibrant health and it becomes your shield. And you think that it's going to carry you through the darkest seasons of your life. But the truth of the matter is Jesus says, I am the true vine. There are many false vines. For some of us, it can be our, our qualifications, our resume, right? Unknowingly, we, we use God and we say, no, God, thank you. You gave me this. You gave me the ability to earn wealth. And yet we connect ourselves to the vine of our qualifications and the vine of our natural abilities and the vine of our skills, whether it's learned or a course that you took or your educational attainment, you know, you're a doctor, you're a professor of this, a professor of theology, and, and you carry this title with you. It has become your vine. And Jesus clearly says, I am the true vine. Right? And a pandemic like this, you know what it does? A pandemic shakes everything so that only the true vine stands. You see, all these other vines that we talked about, they were shaved off during the pandemic. If it was a big bank account, the bank account definitely got smaller during a pandemic like this. And the Lord would shake things that are not Him. Because only the things that are unshakable will remain. What vine have you been connecting to? And you know what's sad? You know what's sad is that, and you'll, you'll, you'll get this. You know, my wife and I, we take supplements and, and maybe you do as well, whether that's something you buy off the counter or, or you, you're loyal to a certain brand. We take supplements. I brought some bottles with me of, of, of supplements. And, and when you read them, some say, you know, vitamin C supplement, multivitamins or, or, or herbal supplement, whatever that is. A supplement is a supplement because it supports your overall health, correct? It supports your system. But the supplement can never take the place of good, old-fashioned, healthy habits. Correct. You cannot be sleeping late, eating bad, and then taking a lot of supplements in the hopes that it will exempt you 
from the health issues that come with your sleeping late, with your, eat, uh, with your bad health habits, with your lack of exercise. I'm guilty of that. And what we do sometimes with Jesus is that we use Jesus as a supplement to our life. We're connected to another vine, but we say, Jesus, you know, you're the supplement of my life. But Jesus did not say he's one of the ways, he's one of the truths, and he's one of the life-giving components. Jesus says, I am the true vine. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. But sometimes with all these other vines, no? We just use Jesus as a mascot and we say, no, supplement Jesus Christ. You know, Lord, thank you for my job, my position, my great pay. Thank you, Jesus. But we really are attached to that vine and we use Jesus as a supplement, an add-on, an additive to our lives. When Jesus says, no, I'm the true vine. One day, whatever you're attached to, I will shake and only the true vine will remain. And that's me, Jesus says. And we should be careful, and I say we because I have the propensity to connect myself to so many things. And there are skill sets that I've learned in the pandemic that has become my medal. And little did I know that my heart was gravitating toward that. And, and I'm saying, Lord, th this has become a vine in my life, but you're the true vine. So there should be some disconnecting that has to take place with some of us. Maybe it's your family business. Whatever that may be, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Does this make sense to you? Amen. Let's move forward a little bit. I know I, I threw in a lot of stuff, but make this, this message today a message of evaluating our own hearts. Have I really been connected to other vines and I've just used Jesus as a supplement in my life. That he's not the main thing. He's a side dish and other things have been my main thing. Did you know that even your family can become your vine and Jesus becomes the additive you put on your family? Icing on the cake. Did you know that that can happen? That your marriage security and your your the closeness and the strength of your family can become the vine that you're connected to. And you notice when the family comes apart, it wrecks the person also. But the truth is, if you're connected to the vine, the true vine that is Jesus Christ, everything can be shaken. But because you're attached to the right source, your heart stays healthy, your worship stays strong, your prayer life blossoms. And you'll know as we go through this, we'll talk about some of the other things in John chapter 15. Are you with me? Yes. Verse 2. Every branch, he says, in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You know, when I read verse 2, uh, the, the first few times I read it, I always questioned the grace of God. I said, Lord, First, you say that you're the true vine and your father is the vine dresser. What a powerful statement. You're the source that we connect to. And our father, that is your father as well, is the vine dresser. There's an inner work that life comes from Jesus. And there's an outward work from the father that's up above. He dresses the vine. He takes care of the vine. Lord, that's full of grace. But when I move to verse 2, Lord, it's so awkward. Because in verse 2, it says... Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. In fact, in other translations, you know what it says? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts. And you're wondering, Lord, where's the grace in that? Is there no room for grace? What if there's a season I'm not bearing fruit? Do you cut me off? Lord, how does that work with, with verse 1 that's so filled with grace and verse 2, it's like you get cut off. Let's do a word study just for a while for, for, for this particular verse we don't do that a lot on a Sunday service. But when you talk about verse 2, to put things in context, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. In other translations, he cuts off. But in the original Greek translation, the word is airo. A-I-R-O. Say that with me. Say airo. Airo. You know what it means? Airo means to lift up, to pick up, to redirect and what he's saying here is that what the vine dresser does when he sees a vine 
that's growing in the wrong direction because vines love to do that, right? We, these, we grow in the wrong direction. When, when I, for instance, as a Christian, there was a season in my life I was detaching from the vine and I was growing in, in any direction I wanted to grow. The grace of the vine dresser is that when he sees a branch that's touching the ground, he picks up the branch, cleans it, and reattaches it to grow in the right direction. And we had this in our home economics class. We, we planted some sort of a, a, a vine, a, a vine-like plant, okay, that would grow and it would spread itself. And in fact, we had to put sticks on the ground and, and allow vines um, a route by which it would grow. It, it would wrap around the, the sticks that we put up. And we were taught this, you know, even in high school. And we noticed that there are some that would not follow where the other vines were going. Some would crawl to the ground. Some would go to other plants. And those that were on the ground, you notice that they were more prone to insects. They were more prone to damage and dirt and grime that's just on top of them. But the vine dresser would pick them up. Airo would lift up the vine, redirect the vine. And that's what Jesus was saying here. He did not literally mean to cut off. He says every branch that does not bear fruit, he begins to lift up and redirect. I don't know about you, but these three things happened to me. There was a, uh, there was a time in my life where he raised me up. He picked me up from the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. And now I'm not moved because Jesus lives in me. And maybe that's your story too. And there's a season in my life where he redirect me, either through a pastor that spoke life to me, a friend that saved me, snatched me from the fire. Cebu was a redirecting moment for me. My marriage was a redirecting moment for me. Promotions you get in your job can be a redirecting moment for you. It's God lifting you up. It's, it's an Iro moment where he would pick you up when you think you're about to hit a dead end. Oh, the grace of the vine dresser. He'd pick you up and then he would reattach you as he redirects you. And maybe that's your story. Sudden reassignments can be God redirecting you. People praying for you can be a form of reattaching you. And there's so many factors at play and at work because of God's grace that abounds in our life. And that is the grace that you should find in verse 2. And notice this as we move to verse 3. Look at You are already clean. Now it connects because verse 3 is so odd. Suddenly you're clean. No, but because He lifted you up, because He pruned you, you went through the process. He picked you up from the dirt. Now He says, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And now enter in verse 4. Key line in what we're going to talk about today. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. To abide means to stay. It means to align. It means to be in connection. Ah, Here's a good word. To be riveted to. You're, you're just linked to the source. And what Jesus was saying, a branch can never bear fruit on its own. It must be connected to the vine. And when you say abide, it's a constant connection. That's why I love the word riveted. It's, it's constant. When you're riveted, you're just there. You're attached. It's the same principle in Proverbs 3 when it says, in all your ways, acknowledge me. The word acknowledge is not just saying, Lord, we acknowledge you. Like in our English today, you know, we just say, you acknowledge people. Like how we greeted people today, we acknowledge them. No, the word is deeper. It means in all your ways, be riveted to me. Be connected to me. In all your decisions, be riveted to me. Abide in me. Stay plugged into the source. And you know what's powerful about verse 4? It's this. My abiding is directly proportional to my fruit bearing. If I abide this much, I bear fruit this much. If I abide this much, I just bear fruit this much. So my abiding in the vine will dictate how great my fruit bearing will be. Did you catch that? In, in verse 5, he, he repeats himself. He says, yes, I, am. I am the true vine and you are the branches. In other words, Jesus was saying, let's make things clear. huh? 
I'm the vine, you're the branches. We cannot switch positions. But our problem is, no, as Christians, sometimes we start a new thing and then we expect God to bless it. In other, in other words, we're saying, Jesus, I'm the vine, you're the branch. I'll start this business, you bless my business, Lord, because I'm your child and I deserve it. No, what God is saying, get a God perspective first. Just like we, 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 we talked about this last week, get a God perspective. See where God's moving and say, Lord, you're moving there. I'm going to go to where you are. And as I step into that, I will be in line with your blessing and with your expansion, with your plans and your direction and your guidance. Because why? He, he is the vine, right? And we're the branches. We follow his leading. If you look at the disciples, it was Jesus who approached the disciples. And what did he say? Come follow me. But I think our issue sometimes as Christians, we want to be the vine. We come to Jesus and say, Jesus, come follow me. But it's never like that. It can never be like that. We cannot try to run our lives because he is the vine and we are the branches. It's clear. And Jesus says, that's how it should be. That's the original design. And look at what it continues to say. Verse 5, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. As long as, long as you stay connected to me, Jesus says, you're going to be a fruit bearer. And your connection to me has nothing to do with what's going on around you physically. There's a pandemic, stay connected with me. In a pandemic, you'll still bear fruit. Your business is about to close. No, no, no. Stay connected to me. Abide in me and watch me carry you through this. I'm not saying that there will be no trouble in your life because the pruning process hurts. But when you've given your life to Jesus, the pain becomes the pruning. Did you catch that? If you're living your life for yourself, the pain is just pain. It's going to destroy you. It's going to define you. But when you've given your life to Jesus and you've connected yourself, you've riveted yourself to the vine, what used to define you will now simply refine you. And what happens is that when you live that way, the pain, the pain just becomes the pruning process because you know, God, you are shaping me. You're shaping my family. You're shaping my marriage to become the marriage that you want it to be. For what purpose? So that I can bear more fruit. Yes, did you catch that? And you realize everything happening in your life, the ups and the downs, it's for the purpose of bearing fruit more fruit and then more fruit and then more fruit fruit that will last such a powerful piece of scripture and look at verse 6 if anyone does not abide in me he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned wow verse 7 if you abide in me and my words abide in you ask what you desire and it shall be done for you but this my father by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples you'll notice in john 15 there are three things that jesus directly and indirectly says that we should abide in okay he, he defines what abiding is and the first is found in verse 7 he says if you abide in me and my words abide in you the very first definition of abiding is to abide in the word of god when you begin to abide in the Word of God, you begin to trust the Word of God. You make His words your life. You know what it does? This is what's beautiful. Verse 7, as His words abide in you, He says here, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. When I abide in His Word, it places me in a position to ask within His will. And when you ask within His will, He answers. Amen. This is the key to answered prayer. When you abide in His words, Lord, how do I define abiding? Start by the Word of God. When I abide in the Word of God, the promises of God, Jesus Christ, the hope of glory that dwells inside of me, and I start to align with that, I feed my spirit with that, it places me in a position to ask 
whatever I desire within his will because his words have become mine. I've made it my own and his will, which is his word, has aligned with my will and my word. Did you catch that? And now I can ask. It puts me in a position to ask anything from the Father. Beautiful. And then it says in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. What's the proof of being a disciple of Jesus? It's not that I can preach good. It's not that I can worship good. It's not that I can play an instrument good. The proof of my being a follower of Jesus is that I am bearing fruit. Amen. Read Psalm chapter 1. Pastor Joe had a great preaching about that, about the Word of God and bearing fruit in season. Come on. First thing, what does abiding mean? Abide. Let His words abide in you. Amen. Now we move verse 9. Look at how powerful this next statement is. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Second thing the Lord tells us to ab what abide means, abide in my love. So the first is abide in my words and abide in my love. But I want you to pause for a while. Can, can you look at verse 9 again? I just want you, we, we read past verse 9 like it's nothing. But I want you to see the weight and the power and the significance of verse 9. Because we ask ourselves, Lord, we go through bad times. We say, Lord, Siguro, you don't love me anymore. Lord, why am I going through this? Do you still love me? Have you forgotten me? But Jesus looks at his, at his disciples, John chapter 15, verse 9. And you're probably wondering today, Lord, how much do you love me? How much do you love me? And Jesus says a powerful statement. He says this, as the Father has loved me, how much do you think the Father loves Jesus. No, no, how much? I can't even measure it, right? How much do you think the Father loves Jesus? Think about the miracles of Jesus. Think about all the teachings of Jesus when Jesus would say, I only say the words my Father permits me to say. I don't do things out of my own will, but what my Father says, there was a relationship before time began between the Father and the Son. So the love that the Father has, has for the Son is something you and I can never comprehend in our life or even in the next. There's an unlimited flow of love between the Trinity. And there's no measuring tool for that. And yet Jesus takes that love that existed before the foundations of the world and He says it this way. He says, you know how much I love you? As much as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Imagine the weight of that. And when you realize the power of verse 9, your sin suddenly feels so small. And your failure suddenly feels so small. Because Jesus was talking about the unending ocean of the love of God. And He's saying, the same brand of love that my Father loved me is the same brand of love that I have loved you. Wow. I hope that blows your mind away. Because he now teaches us and he says, you want to abide? Abide in that love. It's an ocean, an unending ocean of love. And when you're filled with love, fear is pushed aside. Amen. John says that when love is perfected in you, it damages fear. It destroys fear. You want to be a person without fear. Be a person that's filled with the love of God. Abide in his word and then abide in his love. Amen. Verse 10, he defines what this means. If you keep my commandments, he says, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in his love. That's powerful. Lord, what does it mean to abide in your love? Do I just sit and say, Lord, I love you? No, Jesus says, you participate in my will. You participate in the things that I'm doing. How do I participate? Align yourselves, not just in the heart, but by what you do. What you think, what you say, and what you do should align. It becomes proof of your love. So if you're married, you know this. More than saying, I love you, it's doing love, not saying love, right? You've probably attended weddings and you hear all the I love yous, but at the end of the day, what matters is that if love is shown, not if love is said. And that's what Jesus was saying. The proof of love is obedience. 
But some of us live the other way around, no? We force ourselves by our own strength and by our own will to obey. And then we think the product, the byproduct of our obedience is love. Jesus says, no, it's, it's wrong. That's why the first commandment is to love the Lord your God, not to obey the Lord your God, right? You notice Jesus says the first and the greatest commandment is what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, he's saying, you want the secret to obeying me? First, start with loving me. And as you grow in love for me, the obedience becomes a byproduct of your love for me. Did you follow? Amen. So as I'm falling in love with Jesus more and more, I'm not even trying my best. I'm not using my energy to sin less. I'm using my energy to love God more. And as I love God more, I start to sin less and less and less and less until my life comes into complete obedience. And then I can say, Lord, I'm abiding. I'm abiding in you. I'm staying. I'm aligned with you. As I abide in your word, I abide in your love. Isn't that beautiful? And look at this. As you abide in His love, as you abide in His word, not only are you empowered to ask, but you're also empowered to be a fruit bearer. You bear much fruit. Fruit that will last. His word and His love connect you to the source. Amen. Verse 11, look at this. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Third thing of how Jesus defines abiding, abide in my joy. He says, as you abide in my joy, my joy will be in you and that your joy will be full. There's no other way that you and I can attain full joy unless it's His joy that fills you. You can fill your heart with the joy of getting married. It's never going to make your joy go full. You can, you can fill your heart with the joy of extra income, with the joy of extra money, the joy of a house in law, the joy of a brand new car. I, I admit, there is short joy, you know, short-term joy. You have the new car, you have new shoes, you have new uh, stuff. But Jesus says, the only joy that can make you full is my joy. So third definition of abiding is abide in my joy. And what's beautiful, Nehemiah says it this way, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you abide in His joy and His joy is in you and you overflow with that joy, you begin to find new strength. As Isaiah would put it, those that wait upon the Lord in the New Living Translation says, shall find new strength. In other words, guys, Jesus is in you. There's so much strength already, but it's untapped. So as you wait, as you abide in the Lord, you will discover that there's new strength in you. There's auxiliary power inside of you waiting to be tapped. That's why abide. Stay plugged in and I'll make you discover brand new joy. Joy you thought you don't have. Strength you thought you don't have. But it's going to be available to you. His joy becomes your strength. I have a question for you. Will the joy of God ever run out? Of course not. And because His joy is unlimited, my strength is unlimited. As long as I'm abiding in that joy. Did you follow? Yes. Beautiful. John 15 is beautiful. And Jesus begins, and He, he, he begins to talk about the commandment. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends when I abide in the Lord's words when I abide in his joy and when I abide in his love it not only empowers me to bear fruit it not only places me in a position to ask it also fills me with love so that I can love others so the first is, let's, let's align with this. I don't want to be all over the place. His words, His joy, and His love will empower me to bear fruit. That's maturity. And as I align myself continuously to abide in those three, it puts me in a position to ask. That's prayer. And the third is, as I align with those three, with His 
words, with his love and with his joy, it empowers me to love others. And that's bringing the kingdom culture to this world on earth as it is in heaven. Wow, that's powerful. You have maturity, you have prayer, and now you have the kingdom culture at work inside of you. Everywhere you go, you become a carrier of that culture. Are you still with me? Yes? This one gets beautiful, even more so. Look at this. He says in verse 14, he redefines relationship. Check this out. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Pause for a while. What we're studying today is abiding. Did you know that abiding started, it originated from the heart of God? If you go back to Genesis 1, Adam walked with God in the cool of the day, in the garden. God designed us to be in relationship with Him, abiding in Him. To God, it was natural for God to connect to us. But because of our sin, we broke that connection, correct? Because of Adam's sin, we broke that connection. So what was natural to God became unnatural to us. Now, for us to be born and just naturally call upon God is non-existent because of our sinful nature. That's why God sent His Son Jesus to die, to break the power of that sinful nature. So what is unnatural becomes natural. And now we have Jesus in our hearts and Jesus inside us has reconciled us to God, has given us the power to abide in Him once again. That's why the curtain was torn in the temple from top to bottom to signify God saying, it's all my work. It's a finished work in the cross. I tore the veil. And I, you did not take the 99 steps. and I didn't take the 99 steps and you took the one. No, I took the 100 steps for you. That's why I tore the curtain. It's me saying, I'm inviting you to abide, to be in relationship as it was in the Garden of Eden. Walk with me in the cool of the day, just as Adam walked with me, just as Enoch walked with me. Walk with me in the cool of the day. The, the journey with God, as you abide in Him, it becomes a part of your life. You're now in relationship with Him. And it's not a Sunday to Sunday relationship. It's a daily walk with Jesus. That's the beauty of abiding. So as you abide in Him, you get this amazing depth in what God is all about, what He's doing, what His plans are, and where your life is headed in the context of His great plan. You see, God didn't need us, honestly. He can do things His way just like that, but the beauty of this reconciliation is that He put imperfect people like you and me to take part in His perfect plan. God has no plan B. His plan A always works. He does not fail. So for Him to put failures like us and graft us into this perfect plan, and this is the essence of the entire John 15. Jesus, if I may summarize, Jesus knew his disciples would enter a rough time in, in, in their, it would enter a rough season because he would die. And he was saying, guys, I want you to remember this. I'm gonna be crucified. You will lose your leader. But what I want you to do is I want you to stay connected to me. Stay connected to my words. Stay, remember my teachings, all the meals we had together, the last supper, the foot washing, the miracles you've seen. Remember that, stay connected to my words. Stay in my love, stay in my joy, and it will carry you through this season that you're about to enter into. Because God had a plan. They didn't see it, but God knew. Jesus was to die, and He was to rise again in the third day. This plan was laid out before the foundation of the world. He would die, rise again in the third day. He'd take the keys of death with Him, that death would no longer have power on us, on His children, 
that we would become children of God. And it's so wonderful to be a part of this journey. And my responsibility now is what? I got to abide. Sometimes we try to memorize so many things and do so many things in the church, you know, so many activities. When the bottom line is this, are you abiding? Yes, you're a Christian, but are you abiding? Are you a Christian or are you just using Jesus as a supplement, right? We, and that's what happens when we try to live our life on our own and Jesus is simply a supplement and an add-on and He's saying, no, that will drain you, that will burn you out. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. I'm the main thing of your life. Everything else is just a supplement. Verse 16, Jesus digs further about this relationship that He has with us. He says this, You did not choose me. He's telling His disciples, Hey, remember, you're about to enter a tough season. Hey, you're in the middle of this pandemic. Hey, you lost your job. You lost your business. I want you to remember this, Brian. You did not choose me. There was nothing in you that would choose me because I took the 100 steps for you. And Jesus says, I was the one who chose you. How many of you know that His choice is more powerful than our ability to choose, than our choice, right? We can choose God every day and still fail every day. But when God chooses you, there's no fail. When God chooses, He makes up His mind. When we choose, we, we always get undecided one moment. One moment we're emotionally decided. The next moment we're a mess. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I'm not an emotional type of God. When I make a choice, I make a choice and I choose you. He tells his disciples, guys, tough season is coming. Remember this, wherever you find yourselves, you did never chose me, but I chose you. <laughs> what a promise. And, and I hope this, this is something that grabs your heart when you abide in him. Because nobody can come to, the, uh, can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father draws him. The reason why you're able to abide is the Father drawing you to Himself. Even in this season, where it seems that you feel bland, you feel blah, you feel dry, you feel broken, God is saying, no, 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 that's not a drowning moment, that's a drawing moment. I'm calling you to Myself. I'm pruning you. The grace of the vine dresser. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And these things I command you, that you love one another. Wow. John chapter 15. Are you connected to the vine? Or are you connected to all the other false vines? And you just use Jesus as a supplement, huh? I pray that in a time like this, we can walk and journey with God with a level of maturity that says, Lord, it's a tough season, but I know you chose me. I did not choose you even, but you chose me. And you have a plan for my life. You have a plan for my family. Abide in me, Jesus says. John chapter 15. Can we pray together? Sometimes we've lost, we lose the power to abide, no? Sometimes we, I don't know about you, but this has happened to me many times. You know, I ask God, Lord, bakit ganon? Why is it like this? That sometimes I have no gana to, wala akong gana to read the Bible. I don't have any strength to pray. There's nothing in me that wants to worship. Lord, why is it this way? And it makes me, he makes me realize so many times, no, Brian, there's appetites in you that I need to remove because you have an appetite for other vines. And God is saying, I want to dissolve all those appetites for false vines until one appetite remains and it's the appetite to be attached, to be riveted, to abide in the one true vine, the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I dedicate to you my own life this month of October. Lord, we're in the last quarter of the year. Lord, I decide today to make 
effort, all effort to stand where I need to stand. I'm not going to be timid in my Christian life, but Lord, I am going to abide in your words. I'm going to abide in your love and I'm going to abide in your joy so that in doing so, Father, I put myself in a position to bear fruit. I place myself in a position, Father, to ask of you. And I place myself in a position that I can love others. So Lord, I ask you even now, Lord, would you release a brand new grace to abide, to stay in your presence for those that wait upon the Lord will find new strength. They will soar up and mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Father, I dedicate my family to you. I dedicate my marriage to you. Father, may these areas in my life that I tag and brand as important, may they all be aligned and abiding in you, in your joy, in your love, and in your word. As the leader of the household, Lord, let me first be the one that abides. Let me lead my wife and teach my children to abide in you. As a pastor, Lord, teach me. As a business owner, Lord, teach me to be a person that starts the day with abiding in you first. And as I abide in you, everything else will follow with a God perspective, with direction that comes from you to love others to build other people up. Lord, teach me. And I thank you, Lord, that Lord, no matter what we're facing at this very moment, you chose us. We did not choose you, but you chose us and you chose us to be fruit bearers, even in this dark season. So Lord, we thank you and we glorify you. Today, Lord, I decide to attach myself to the true vine and I disconnect from other false vines that give life, short-term life, life that is just for the moment. And Lord, we gravitate to that sometimes because it's what we see and what we experience every day. When you've come to us and you said, I am the true vine, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life, only you, Jesus. And let that be my declaration today for my life, only you. For my family, only you, Jesus. For our church, Lord, only you. For our ministry, only Jesus. And Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you that we can hold on to these words in a tough season like this. We bless you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, let us know in the comments below. If it was a reminder for you, let us know as well. God bless you. We love you. Definitely. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place.